If someone were to describe an engine as having an aluminum block, double overhead cams, and a flat plane crank, you generally wouldn't think of a vintage engine when you hear those terms. But the fact of the matter is that all of those elements were a feature of the largest gasoline engine ever produced by Ford, and one of the largest gasoline engines ever produced in the world. And that is the Ford GAA V8 engine that was introduced in 1940. Yes, I said that right. In 1940, Ford had an engine that had an all-aluminum block, double overhead cams, and a flat plane crank, if you can believe that. Now, the interesting wrinkle here is that the GAA engine was not ever used in traditional automotive applications. In fact, the engine was massive, with a maximum displacement of 1,100 cubic inches, or 18 liters. In fact, the GAA was often what powered the Sherman tank and its successor, the M26. But there were, in fact, four different engines that were found in Sherman tanks. The first was the Continental R975 radial engine. It was a nine-cylinder, four-cycle, 973 cubic inch radial engine that made around 400 to 450 gross horsepower and it weighed about 1,150 pounds. This actually was an engine that was engineered by the Wright Company, but it was built by Continental for use in the Sherman tank. And by the time it was used in the Sherman tank, it had already been around for about a decade and had been used in a number of airplanes before it made its way into tanks. So here you have an air-cooled airplane engine that the Sherman tank, frankly, was actually designed around. And I believe somewhere around 50,000 of these Continental engines were employed in the Sherman tanks. However, you can imagine that there were some challenges associated with using what was effectively an aircraft engine in a tank. And more or less, one of those big challenges was that though it was a solid and reliable engine, it was a bit underpowered and you really had to get the engine revving in order to move the tank with any bit of, well, I guess I'll call it speed. And the other issue associated with this was that the design in terms of its physical size was just not ideal. Radial engines are very tall and they're also wide. And this really dictates how large the rear portion of the tank had to be. And so consequently, the Sherman tank had a pretty big rear. In any case, as I mentioned, these engines were pretty reliable if underpowered and found their way in many Sherman tanks. Another engine that was found under the Sherman tank's armor was the General Motors 6046, which was an engine that GM specifically designed for the Sherman tank. It was a 12-cylinder, two-cycle, if you can call it twin inline diesel, kind of twin six-cylinder engines, displacing about 850 cubic inches, and it was rated at 410 gross horsepower, 885 pound-feet of torque, and it weighed around 5,000 pounds, so much, much heavier than the radial engine that I just mentioned. This engine was really two GM supercharged truck diesel engines that were tied together with a common crankcase. This engine also had an interesting feat in that if one of the banks of the six cylinders failed, the tank could still be operable, although obviously it was down on power. So kind of a really interesting engine, but not the most popular for Sherman tanks and not the most ideal fit either. The third engine was the Chrysler A57 multi-bank engine. And this was, again, a engine that Chrysler developed for tanks. It was a 30-cylinder, yes, I said that right, 30-cylinder, four-cycle, 1,253 cubic inch engine. that was rated about 425 gross horsepower, 1060 foot-pounds of torque, and weighed about 5,000 pounds yet again. This engine is so crazy that it really deserves its own video, and we won't touch on the technical highlights, but I think I whet your appetite by saying that Chrysler produced a 30-cylinder, 1,253-cubic-inch engine in 1941. How cool is that? People think that the Bugatti engines and the VW engines, the W-banked engines that are effectively two narrow angle V6s basically mated together are so cool. Well, this is even cooler. And now we come to the fourth and final engine that was employed in the Sherman tanks, and that was the Ford GAA that I previously mentioned. This 
eight cylinder, four cycle, double overhead cam, flat plane crank, all aluminum block engine that was rated at about 450 gross horsepower, 500 gross horsepower in that range, and 950 pound feet of torque. And really, because it was all aluminum, it weighed just 1,560 pounds. It was an extremely light, if you can call 1,560 pounds, light V8. Now, another strange feature of the Ford GAA was that it was actually a 60-degree V8 as opposed to a typical 90-degree V8. And that wasn't because Ford was trying to design a more narrow bank angle for packaging. As I mentioned, the Sherman tank was designed to accommodate even radial engines, so that wasn't the main constraint. It was really because the engine started life as a Ford V12 V8 with all of the same features that I just mentioned. Ford, in fact, had designed a V12 to really compete with Rolls-Royce Merlin. And in order to compete with this, Henry Ford really wanted to build an engine of the same size and configuration as that Rolls-Royce Merlin engine, but one that would be more advanced. And hence, the Ford engineering team developed a 1,650 cubic inch double overhead cam, 48 valve V12 engine. And Henry Ford approached the Army Air Corps with this proposal to produce for them. Unfortunately, the contract had already been awarded to the Allison 1710 V12 engine, but while Henry Ford didn't win out with his V12 proposal for aircraft, the Army Tank Corps actually said that it needed an engine that was suitable for the Sherman tank, and Ford consequently lopped four cylinders off of this V12 proposal and came up with the aforementioned 1100 cubic inch double overhead cam, all aluminum, V8 that powered the Sherman tanks, as I mentioned before. Ford ended up making a total of around 30,000 GAA engines, and of those, about half were installed into the Sherman tanks. The rest were made for service parts and retrofitted into earlier model tanks. So quite a few of these were produced. And while the engine was rated at around 500 gross horsepower, that rating occurred at 2,600 RPMs, which seems like a relatively low RPM at which peak horsepower is occurring for a double over cam engine. And it, it obviously is, but it is a very, very large engine. But one of the interesting things is that some army tales suggest that tank crews actually disabled the governors on the GAA engine, allowing the engine to spin faster and make even more horsepower. Some reports put the peak power output actually around 525 horsepower or 530 horsepower at closer to 3,000 RPMs. And so this is what some, as I mentioned, some tank crews allegedly did to get even a bit more power out of the GAA V8 engine. Aside from the features I already mentioned, the GAA had some really cool and strange features. It had two four-cylinder distributors, one per bank. And it was an uneven firing design, owing to the fact that I mentioned it was a 60-degree V8. And Ford tried to dampen the effects of this out with a 150-pound flywheel. So as opposed to having split journals for the rods like the Buick 3.8-liter V6, which is a 90-degree V6, Ford just decided that, well, they weren't going to do that. And they tried to quell the vibration with a really heavy flywheel. Up top, the GAA was fed with dual Stromberg aircraft two-barrel carburetors, one at each end of the engine, and the airflow of these two-barrel carburetors was pretty good, about 450 CFM each, or about 960 CFM in total. So they were about the size of a Rochester 2GC carburetor that you would find under hood of many General Motors cars or even the Autolite 4100s, which in some cases were a bit smaller than that. But it's effectively like having two two-barrel carburetors, two large two-barrel carburetors at either end of the engine to feed the cylinders. And while many double overhead cam engines employ belts or chains to drive the overhead cams, this was not a feature of the GAA. Ford wanted the engine to be very reliable, didn't want belts to break. Obviously, this engine is going to be used in combat. And as a consequence, the cams are driven by worm gears and there are no belts or timing chains in this. It's kind of an ingenious design, and it worked. And I think that's the amazing thing about this GAA engine overall. It was allegedly the Army's favorite engine to find in the Sherman tanks because it was easy to service as a V8 engine as opposed to the crazy 30-cylinder thing that Chrysler came up with. 
It was reliable, it was durable, and so somehow on its first foray into this 1100cc double overhead cam monster, Ford got it right. It's kind of like when Boeing came out with the 707 airplane that it just got so much right, right from the get-go. But that's effectively what happened. I think it's just amazing to say that Ford designed this in an era before even World War II and production started in 1940. So what looks on paper like an advanced engine, even by today's standards, was just astronomically ahead of its time in 1940 when it was first introduced. And that is the story and history of Ford's 1100 cubic inch GAA V8 engine. Hope you enjoyed. If you did, be sure to like, comment, and subscribe, and check out the video thumbnails at bottom left and right for some suggestions for you. Thanks again for watching.